Hey there, welcome to episode 78 of the Social Business Engine podcast. This is the podcast where I invite leaders from brands across all industries who are excited to share with you, the modern business executive, how they use social media in their business strategy. I'm Bernie Borges, CEO of Find and Convert and your host of the Social Business Engine podcast. I'm excited today to have Mark Schaefer join us on this episode. Mark Schaefer is an acclaimed college educator, author, speaker, and social media strategy consultant who has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the CBS News. Mark has authored five popular marketing books that are used as textbooks in more than 50 universities. Now, on this episode, we're going to discuss key takeaways from Mark's most recent book, The Content Code. Specifically, we're going to discuss how information density is impacting the modern marketer's challenge to cut through the intimidating wall of noise and become the signal with your customers and stakeholders. Now, this episode is sponsored by Vanilla Forums, creators of a leading online community forum platform that's used by companies to engage customers, employees, and fans. We are publishing a social business journal issue with Vanilla that's titled The Community Playbook. This guide provides all the information that you need to get your online community started and keep it thriving. Now, if you're subscribed by email to get our weekly podcast updates, which we send every Friday, you will be notified when this journal gets published. If you're not subscribed to our weekly updates, well, what are you waiting for? <laughs> just visit our subscribe page or just download it directly from our journals page at our website, socialbusinessengine.com. Now, there's one more thing that I'm excited about today, and that is that I am joined by a co-host. And my co-host on this episode is Mel Atia, Vice President of Marketing at Vanilla Forums, joining me from beautiful Montreal. Mel, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Terrific. Well, Mel, let's bring Mark Schaefer in. Mark, welcome to the Social Business Engine podcast. I am delighted to be here. Did, did anybody ever tell you you sound like Casey Kasem? You know, I actually have been told that before. You have a good radio voice, my friend. <laughs> yeah, well, I've had some fun with that. I have I've had Spinning some fun. Spinning the hot top 40. <laughs> and me. Yeah, well, and you. Yeah. And by the way, I'm old enough to remember him too. So, <laughs> Well, Mark, um, this, the content code, this is your fifth marketing book. First of all, Congratulations. I mean, it's an awesome book. All four of your marketing books have been bestsellers and popular. And as I mentioned in the intro, used as textbooks in over 50 universities. So congratulations. But let's begin our conversation today, Mark, with what inspired you to write this one, The Content Code? Well, I, I don't have a plan to write uh, a book every year, but it just seems like there's a big question out there each year that I simply can't answer with a blog post. So uh, when I've written my other books, there's something going on in the marketplace that is really consuming my customers and my students. And so I, you know, I, I want to help them. So I, I write a book. And the question I think that is maybe people see it and feel it but haven't been able to articulate it yet is this problem where, you know, we're, we're following all the rules of the things we're supposed to be doing on social media and content and, and nothing really seems to be happening. In fact, it seems to be getting harder. And as you mentioned, the key theme of the book is this idea of information density. That's mm -hmm. what's making it hard. And it's kind of predictable because as we go through each phase of digital marketing. So when we first had the web and created a website, when we first started SEO and gave our money to, you know, to, to Google or, or some SEO uh, specialist, uh, each time the first movers had an advantage. And then once our competitors figured it out, it became more difficult and more expensive to compete. 
And that's what's happening now in the phase we're in. This is a phase that's been enabled by social media and mobile, and it's fueled by content. And it's worked really, really well. But when it works well, people start climbing on board. <clears throat> and if you look at all the research that's out there, that people have been plowing more and more budget into creating content. And so um, there's this uh, just a ma- this tsunami, this tidal wave of content mm-hmm. coming at us. Consumers only have so much time to <clears throat> to consume content. And so it's the same whether you have an economic system, a natural system, or a human system. When there's too much of something, there's got to be an adjustment. There's a shift that happens. And this is what I bring out in my book. What does that shift have to be? How do we win in this very challenging environment? Hmm. So you do touch on uh, an entire chapter on building an alpha audience and essentially as a method to break through the noise. Can you explain a little bit what that is and why it's important? Well, I think it's really critical. Uh, f- first, let me take a step back because to understand the alpha audience, you have to understand the major premise of the book, and it is this. Today, the marketing conversation is all about content, more content, optimized content, creating epic content, and building an audience. But the thing that's missing is the ignition. The economic value of the content is zero unless people see what you're doing and share it. And so this suggests this idea of of focusing on social sharing and the ignition of the content. It suggests an entirely new competency that we need to think about in our marketing initiatives. Who is sharing our content? Now, since I wrote the book, came out a few months ago, I've been talking a lot about this and I've been visiting with a lot of companies and organizations. And every single time I ask them, who are the people who share your content the most? And every single time the answer has been, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the people who are driving the economic value of your marketing. These are the people who are essentially the advocates for your business. And this is who I call the alpha audience. And when you dig into this, generally, it's about 2% of your followers, maybe even less. Generally, people don't share content. So we have to look at this special group, this elite group, and figure out who are these people? How do they share content? Why do they share it? Where do they share it? How do we nurture them? How do we reward them? How do we get them to share more? And how do we turn that 2% into 3%? I think that's a real business driver. I think that should be uh, a marketing metric as we move forward. And so that's a little bit about what the alpha audience is and why it's so very critically important to begin to understand that. Now, Mark, you know, you mentioned um, the question of sharing that you ask companies that you that you meet with and visit with how people share their content. Then you also mentioned content ignition. And mm-hmm. we just talked about alpha audience. And, I, and I'm, I'm intrigued by the fact that in your book, your chapters are actually in that sequential order, building shareability into your content, content ignition, and building the alpha audience. So I actually, I want to go back to content ignition because I, I, I'm really intrigued by that. And in your book, chapter four is 22 practical ways to achieve content ignition. So we're not going to go through all 22 here because, first of all, we don't have the time. And secondly, we'd rather have people read the book and get all 22. But I'd like to hone in on one of them, which is number five, and that is aim for conversation, not controversy. Can you Mm. comment on that? Well, what I'm trying to do, and, and actually this whole idea of, of, of shareability is so important that um, I put it at the front of the, of the book for, for a very good reason, and that is I'm smart enough to realize and honest enough to realize that most people aren't going to read the book cover to cover. 
But, and I think this is the most important chapter of the book. I think people can get the most out the, of this. The shareability chapter? Shareability. So okay. that's why I put it up front, because okay. I thought if people only read one chapter, I hope it's this one. Okay. Because there are so many things that we can do to remove obstacles to get our content to move. So that's the goal, not just to publish. If, if you just publish and nobody sees it, nobody shares it, then you might as well just lock it in a vault someplace. We need to eliminate every obstacle. We need to give our content every chance it, it can possibly get to move and be seen. So um, a lot of the... Uh, the, a lot of the recommendations in this chapter are mechanical. It has to do with uh, the form of your content, the length of your content, the style of headlines, hashtags. Now, the one that you bring up, I, I brought in for a specific reason, and that's because there are a lot of – I shouldn't say a lot. There are a few uh, marketing consultants out there that actually – recommend that you pursue a strategy of controversy because controversy does attract attention and it does move content. But I'm against that strategy. I don't really think it's sustainable for uh, two reasons. Number one, that your goal with marketing over time is to build an engaged and loyal audience that, that trusts you. And I don't think anybody trusts a bully. I think you might... Uh, watch a school year schoolyard fight because it's kind of fascinating and you can't tear your eyes away. But you know that's not the real the kind of person you're necessarily going to um, that you're going to befriend. The other reason is I don't really think it's sustainable because most companies. I mean, I've been in business more than thirty years. I've worked with a lot of different companies, and I can't name one that would adopt a strategy of being controversial. Mm -hmm. Most companies avoid controversy. So a, a better way to build this alpha audience and, and, and get your content to move is to create provocative, original content, interesting, entertaining content that will attract people organically and, and begin uh, conversations. So, so when you talk about this content to to build conversation, right? Would you also say that it's a parallel to building trust? Um, I, I think I think that's that's part of it over time because what happens is whenever we connect to people on social media, we're only creating weak relational links, and this is a very important idea because a lot of new businesses just getting into this for, for the first time really overestimate what social media is going to be able to do for them. There's a lot of hype around it. There's a lot of expectations. But uh, these weak relational links only open a door. It's like meeting somebody for the first time at a, at a networking meeting. If you don't follow up and pursue the conversation and pursue the relationship – Nothing's going to happen. Same thing happens on the web. The web is fantastic at opening these new doors, at creating awareness. But awareness is not enough to make somebody do something. You've got to, you've got to seek some sort of engagement. You need to create provocations, reasons for them to interact with you so that awareness can lead to engagement and eventually – if they engage with you long enough, that engagement leads to trust. And that's when the business benefits begin to accrue. Normally, not right away. Only after we engage with people over a period of time and build those relationships that turn into stronger relational links. Would you say that those stronger relational links can be built into almost that audience be transformed into an online community? And is that you know, do you see them as being similar or working together? Well, uh, yes. I mean, it's 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 interesting. Um, I've I've seen a transition really over the years where I don't know it's a func if it's a function of of time uh, or if it's a function of this information density. Um, 
but I, I'm seeing changes in the ways that that that, that people uh, interact, and I haven't seen anything scientific around it, but I see that there there used to be a lot more interaction between community members on social media, and now they, they people kind of come in and maybe they'll interact with me, and and then they'll leave uh, for uh, for a period of time. And when you look at all these dynamics that are going on and you look at how do we cut through in this age of information density, there was, a, there was an article recently by the uh, MIT, MIT Sloan Review that talked about engagement as marketing, that this is a way to cut through, that if you can find a way to uh, engage consistently and keep people bringing, keep the, bringing them back, then that is a very effective type of, of marketing. That is a very effective way to build your alpha audience, as I call it in the book. Now, Mark, you said earlier in this conversation that the, the chapter on sharing is an important, if not the most important chapter, and that's why you put it up early in the book. And in, in your book, you, you, you explain why people even share content. So since that's such an important chapter, do you want to elaborate on that, what you say in the book, why people share content to begin with? Yeah, it, it's a very important concept. Um, if businesses are to win in this new environment, we need to start to adjust our mindset to put ourselves in the place of, of the consumers and the readers uh, of the content. And there are a lot of reasons why people share content, but there are three big ones. Number one, it's an expression of your self-identity. So you want to be cool. You want to be relevant. You want to look smart. So I'm going to share something that makes me look relevant, cool, and smart. The second reason is that people share to be kind, to be helpful. There aren't that many ways in our world today where we can really have an impact on people on a daily basis. But sharing content is one of the few ways available to us to, to do that. And so you might see an article or a video and say, wow, you know, my mom would really like that. I got to send that to her. Or, wow, this, this made me cry. This, this, this had an amazing emotional impact on me. I want to share this because I think it'll have an impact on others. Or this helped me and I want to help others. The third reason is, is really quite interesting, and that is that people share content and it has nothing to do with the content and everything to do with the person, the organization, or the brand that's creating the content. So every business has a brand, every person has a personal brand, but not everybody has a heroic brand. And that's another chapter in the book. And, and so this is a, a very... Uh, interesting thing because people will share, share content just because they believe in somebody. They believe them, they trust them, and the brand itself transcends the content, transcends social media, transcends SEO. People share because they believe in this person, they love this person, and that is a legitimate way, legitimate reason why people share content. They just want to support that person or organization. So do you have advice for brands that are typically boring, you know, like uh, Fiskars <laughs> that make scissors for scrapbookers or you yeah. know, gardening shears uh, to get them to, to get their customers to engage with them through their content? Well, Fiskars actually has done a fantastic job. It's one of my, it's, it's one of my favorite uh, case studies. And it, it, uh, you know, I'm not sure how much they've changed their strategy I probably haven't checked in on them in a, in a year or so, but of course, they've built an amazing community around the passion for for uh, scrapbooking. And you mentioned the gardening. I, I thought at the time when they did that, boy, there's also an opportunity to create a community around the gardening too. Have they done that? Do you know? No, I don't know. I'm just personally interested because I'm a gardener. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me and too. I, and I see their products all the time when I yeah, go me, to me, me that too. big and they, store with the orange colors. Yeah, and all that. yeah. well, they started with the scrapbooking, and actually, I studied that for a long time. It's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful case study, and I think there's lots of examples out there of people with so-called boring products that have tapped into people who love them. 
And I think Fiskars is a heroic brand because people love what they stand for. They trust the company. I think Fiskars has gone out of their way to um, be transparent, to bring people into their headquarters and meet their executives and really create a, a, a human approach to building their uh, community. And uh, so I think that's, that's, that's a great uh, example. I think there are opportunities. I think it gets down to trust. I think the people are out there. Um, and uh, the, when I, I, I interviewed more than 50 people for the book around this idea of the, of the heroic brand. What, what makes them stand out? What makes them want to um, share this content? I, I, I interviewed one lady. She shares my content every day without even reading it. And she's in PR. I'm thinking, why would you do that? What if I have a bad day? And she said, because I trust you. Yep. <clears throat> I never you you never let me down. You have never created That's a, a lot of pressure, content. Mark. It is a lot of pressure, but you know, <laughs> but here's the thing, Bernie. That's the way it has to be. Yeah. You've got to feel that pressure. Yeah. And and you know the, the amazing thing is, and the sad thing in a way, I think trust is a point of differentiation today. When you see how many times companies disappoint people, I mean, how many times is Facebook in the news for doing something with privacy that disappoints people? How many times is Google in the news? They're being sued in Europe. I mean, I, I, I think it's an opportunity for companies to stand up and say, you, you can trust us. We will never let you down and, and put trust at the forefront. And, you know, I think it's, a, it's an opportunity. Yeah, you also, in your book, you talk about social signals and social proof, and you talk about how brands can leverage that. But you also shared a caution that really intrigued me, and I want, <laughs> I want, I want, to, I want to ask you to share that caution. Well, I don't know if it's a caution for everybody, but it was certainly a caution for me. Um, years ago, it's, it's, it's been... Um, it's ended now, but there used to be a, a, a rating system on Ad Age magazine. Oh, I can't remember what it was. It's like the, it was the top blogs, the top marketing and advertising blogs in the world. And to me, this was an important demonstration of social proof. In this information-dense world, when we don't know who to believe or what to read, we look for signals. So – the number of likes, the number of tweets on an article might be an indication that this is a safe place. It's something good. If somebody has a lot of followers on Twitter, that may be an indication that they're influential and they're trusted. Not necessarily, but I mean, we use these shortcuts. And so something like testimonies, reviews, and to me, having a good place on this blog rating system was important. I was a, I was a just a beginning blogger. I was starting this new company, and the problem was I became obsessed with this number, and I would just freak out if it would go down three or four points in a day, and I started like managing my blog and managing my business to try to achieve this number. I wasn't. I was focused on the wrong things. Mm. And I do see that with a lot of people. People become obsessed with a clout score. Mm -hmm. If your if your readers aren't or your listeners aren't familiar with that, it's a it's a little algorithm that that, that looks at your content and uses big data to try to estimate how influential you are online. Mm -hmm. People become obsessed with with likes, with the number of followers that they have, with getting mentions from influencers. And I think. Uh, you know, those things have some importance, but you need to stay centered. You need to stay focused on the things that bring value to your business. And so for me, I, I stripped out every single item of social proof for my blog and said, I'm not even going to look at it anymore. And I mean, I, I can't even tell you really how many followers I have. I can't tell you what my clout score is I, because I just try to stay centered on doing good work engaging with people, being kind, lifting them up. And I trust that's going to be what's going to you know, create a great community for me and, and, uh, and a great business. 
So you went cold turkey on that, Mark. I did. And it's, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> I did. I'm, and I'm not following my own advice because social proof is important. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's serving us well. When I say us, I mean those of us who know, like, and trust you and, and, and like that one um, fan of yours, I'm going to call her a fan, who retweets you no matter, without reading your content. Yeah. You know, that's, that's proof, a proof statement right there of the, the, the trust that you've built uh, among your audience. So, uh, you, you're doing it right. You're doing it right, Mark. Well, it took a long time to, to earn that, and and I'm not going to screw it up. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, I'm 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 never going to give people a reason not to trust me. Yeah, I totally agree. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to summarize uh, kind of the key takeaways from our conversation, and then I'm going to ask you a little bit of a different twist to my my one thing question. Mm-hmm. So um, here's what I've got is kind of a summary of the key takeaways. You talked about the importance of building an engaged audience that trusts you. We just ended on that note. You, you talked about the importance of shareability. You mentioned it. That's perhaps the most important chapter in the book or one of the most important chapters. And that conversation trumps controversy in mm. terms of building an audience, mm-hmm. building mm-hmm. that trust. You mentioned that social media um, – builds weak links and we didn't talk about it but you've got a uh, section in your book where you talked about how you actually did some fundraising for a, for a, a nonprofit through social media but you learn that social media has weak relational links mm-hmm. uh, that's fascinating you talk about we talked about how awareness leads to engagement and ultimately can build trust you also mentioned that people share content for three reasons uh, expression of self-identity people want to be cool relevant and smart Secondly, they want to be kind or helpful. And third, they believe in the originator of the content because they Mm -hmm. trust that person. And then you talked about how brands who humanize themselves, like Fiskars, can do a really good job of building trust. And then that last topic that we discussed, social signals, you say you're not practicing what you preach, and that social (laughs) signals can be an indicator of influence or trust. But as you you shared that only that your experience of yours, which was really... Um, I appreciate, you know, you being that honest and and that transparent about sharing that experience, Mark, because you kind of offer that as a caution, like don't obsess over those uh, social signals. So with all those takeaways, here's my one thing question, Mark. If there's any one thing from this conversation that you would recommend that a listener takes action on right away, what would that be? Well, we, we talk, you asked some very good questions about <clears throat> shareability. And I believe very, very strongly that today content is not the finish line. Content is the starting line. Content was the finish line a few years ago. Mm-hmm. It was still novel. And, but for many industry verticals today, the world is getting very noisy and very crowded. So I would encourage people to uh, think about how do we encourage people to share our content? How do we put systems in place? How do we remove every barrier we can to get that content to move? Because that is the key to driving economic value for our social media and content marketing. Okay, terrific. Well, Mark, before we um, exit out of here today, first of all, I want to thank you so much for being thank with you. us today. It was fun. And sharing uh, these these insights, these pearls of wisdom from your latest book, The Content Code. Where would you like to send people to online to learn more about you and your book? You can find everything about me at businessesgrow.com. My uh, podcast is there, The Marketing Companion that I do with Tom Webster. All of my books, including the one we discussed today, The Content Code. You can find my blog and lots of other free resources for businesses of every size. Terrific. And my listeners know that that will be linked up in our show notes. And Mel, hey, thank you so much for co-hosting with me today. It was fun. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm so glad we got to speak, uh, Mark. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you so much for, for being here today. Yep. Well, I'm sure that my listeners got a lot out of this conversation today with Mark Schaefer. And I just want to remind everyone before we sign off that this episode is sponsored by Vanilla Forums, creators of a leading online community forum platform that's used by companies to engage customers, employees, and fans. And we're publishing a social business journal issue with Vanilla that's titled The Community Playbook. 
And this guide provides all the information that you need to get your online community started and to keep it thriving. As I mentioned in the intro, if you're subscribed by email to get our weekly podcasts that we send every Friday, you'll be notified when this journal gets published. And if you're not subscribed to our weekly updates, as I said earlier, what are you waiting for? Just visit our subscribe page or just download it directly from our journals page at our website, socialbusinessengine.com. If you're a regular listener to the Social Business Engine podcast, please consider writing a review in iTunes for us. Just visit socialbusinessengine.com slash iTunes. And hey, if you're a first-time listener and you're so motivated, hey, that's okay too. I would welcome that. And of course, be sure to engage with us in our social media channels across Twitter, Facebook, Google+. Follow our hashtag, SBE Show. And that is is going to do it for this episode. I want to once again thank my co-host, Mel Atia from Vanilla Forums. And of course, I want to thank my guest, Mark Schaefer. This is Bernie Borges of Find and Convert, wishing you continued success on your social business journey. <laughs>